Good morning and welcome to the Stalls TV Morning Show. I'm Zach. And I'm Josh. And we have an absolutely amazing episode for you this morning, all about pricing strategy and some other cool stuff. Yeah, and, and pricing strategy is really important to a business um, because it helps you to figure out really how you'll be profitable. And so we're going to spend the first eight to ten minutes of the episode really highlighting uh, five specific uh, pricing strategies. They are economy pricing, uh, pricing for market penetration, bundling, pricing at a premium, and then also the concept of price skimming. Uh, we're going to talk about actually the first installment of a new series, which is um, eight ways to improve your brand. And I think you have the first installment, right? Yes. Yes, I did have the first installment. And it's all about your company logo, whether it needs a redesign or whether you need to design it for the first time. It's kind of five tips on what to look for when you're designing your company logo. And then we also give you three different places that you can go to get that done if you don't want to do it yourself. And then additionally, we always like to share some updates from stallstv.com. We've recently published the layering guide for heat transfer vinyl. Some of you are probably able to attend live last week. Uh, but it's an hour-long class that's published under the live events archive on stallstv.com and it will walk you through uh, best practices for layering materials at the heat press and also in design work uh, with different methods to do that. And then we have, uh, last but not least, a few exciting classes coming up this week. Um, Bob Robinson is giving um, basically how to decorate with the regulations for team uniforms for fall sports. That's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then the folks from Great Dane Graphics, Dane and Joe, are sharing a series on creating artwork for vinyl cutting, and that's on Thursday. There's a Corel Draw edition that Joe's doing, and then Dane is giving an Illustrator edition. So you can find all of that under the upcoming events on stallstv.com. Okay, so let's talk about pricing. And when we talk about pricing, we're, we had talked a little bit earlier today about doing an exercise with bundling, which we'll talk a little bit about bundling. But one of the things that that exercise didn't bring out was how much profit you're actually going to make. It was pricing for gross revenues when at the end of the day, profit is what pays the bills. So these pricing strategies that we're going to talk about are all around how do you make the most profit for your business, whether it's a good strategy or a bad strategy for profit making, not necessarily gross revenues. Yeah, pricing without profit is pointless. That was awesome alliteration. <laughs> all right, I do my best. But we have the five different strategies. So with a, a proper understanding of cost, mm -hmm. you can start to get a proper understanding of which price strategy to implement to make maximum profit. Um, in order to understand how to calculate costs, we have plenty of tutorials on Stalls TV that you can watch. But let's get on with our first pricing model um, that we've identified, and that is the concept of just an economy price model. Yeah, and I think this is the first one that we identify because it's the one that we all tend to resort to when we get into sales conversations. We always want to have the lowest price because it makes it the easiest sale, but that's not always what's necessarily best for the business. So who are some folks who do a great job of economy pricing? Well, I think large, when we look at large businesses that everybody would be familiar with, sort of outside of decorated apparel, you look at um, companies like Walmart, you mm -hmm. look at uh, Sam's Club, uh, Costco, those uh, come to mind when you talk about having low pricing across the board on products. Yeah, so how can they, how do they make that work? And why don't we think that's a good model for most decorators that watch the show? Well, I think scale and size is really important. Um, they were built off of that. They probably had a lot of funds at the, at the onset. Mm -hmm. And basically, they rely on their low price um, attracting more consumers. And so basically, reach is through word of mouth whether that, rather than over-investing in marketing expense or expensive production expense. They aim uh, on volume and mm -hmm. quantity uh, rather than you know, just high margins on every product. Right, so a dollar, making a dollar on a thousand customers to them is better than making five dollars on 100 customers. Exactly, or 200 customers uh, right. for the equal. But um, I think that's a viable model for large businesses and really to relate that to a decorated apparel standpoint, um, that's what I think of when I think of high volume screen printing and, and embroidery shops. Mm -hmm. I think if you're a high volume shop with automatic machines and a lot of capability, perhaps even um, offshore manufacturing, then you really have a good start and a good infrastructure to look at this economy pricing model and stand out across the board on all decorated goods. Right. There is a way that if you don't have that type of scale or that type of reach that you can benefit from 
uh, I guess, an abbreviated economy model, and that is um, pricing for market penetration. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about pricing for market penetration, that's taking a particular product or even your whole product line and pricing it at a low price just to get into the market to get established with the plan to increase the price as you go or taking people from that low price to a different product <clears throat> that may be at a premium price with more profit in it. Yeah, there's, there's a couple different ways for pricing for market penetration. You may have heard us refer to it as establishing a loss leader. Mm -hmm. um, so this can even be as you're starting your business or let's say um, you have to have first an, a target market, an identified market that you want to reach and being able to go after that market strategically with a suite of products or a singular product in order to attract customers. Um, knowing that I'm not going to make profit, I'm not going to make money, but it's a cost of acquiring a customer in lieu of marketing dollars expense and the other ways of acquiring a customer. Right, so instead of doing a lot of advertising, instead of investing in a lot of those other things, whether it's billboards, newspaper ads, whatever your marketing dollars are going into, you invest it into customer acquisition costs through the low price with, again, the ultimate goal of either knowing that you're going to raise that price as the business goes on or get them into a product that they're going to use more often that is profitable for the business. Yeah, and I think a great example of this for an apparel decorator is to uh, make sure you limit this to a certain scope. Mm -hmm. And it's a great sort of uh, marketing tool and advertising tool to bring people in. So for instance, the $5 embroidered polo up to X number of stitches. Mm -hmm. And you know, here's the polo style that you have access to for that $5. Mm -hmm. And really, once a customer comes into the range, it's not a bait and switch, but they can certainly get that, but it's only with these um, style selection and choices. So knowing when it comes time to reorder, that customer's probably not gonna want the same polo that you acquired them with, with the same colorway, the same number of stitches. And so it's a great way to uh, bring somebody in and then grow them in the business. Yeah, so another strategy that kind of involves um, taking your advertising dollars or your marketing dollars and rolling them into product, uh, a product-based focus is product bundling or price bundling. So where do you see this working? Uh, price bundling, I mean, it's very popular and I think it's important for an apparel decorator because um, any sales strategy should include uh, getting a higher dollar, a higher average sale um, to the customer that's going to purchase. And bundling is a natural way to do that. You show the customer savings. Uh, for instance, this is the add a bag to a team uniform mm -hmm. package or add you know, um, shorts and socks to the t-shirt uh, for the dance school. Um, I think it works well for apparel decorators, but you have to deliver um, some savings. So I see this uh, working a lot to add an additional item. Um, the cool thing about this is it doesn't always have to be decorated. Mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if it's going to be a decorated item, we know if we're ordering a screen printed transfer, maybe there's some extra room on that sheet mm -hmm. um, where we can really not increase um, our cost of materials other than the actual labor of um, applying the transfer uh, to an additional item. Right, another way bundling can work is by bundling a service that you might not normally offer, whether you, uh, if you're shipping to your customers rather than delivering or if you charge for delivery, including free delivery or free shipping as part of your product bundle can work as well. Yeah, and, and another way, um, you can associate a value with um, an offer and then bundle it for free. For instance, um, if you're te selling track jackets or uniforms uh, to a team, having some sort of fitting service mm -hmm. that's available for free where you can send in size samples relative to you know the blank item that that team is ordering, having a normal cost of this and being able to bundle it as part of your team package is a great way to give some perceived value with limited additional expense or labor on your part. Right. Now let's move to what is, I think, both of our favorite pricing strategy. I'd say so, yeah. Yeah, which is premium pricing because premium indicates profit. Yeah, it indicates that you have something of value mm -hmm. um, and it indicates that you um, have due diligence to understand um, the market. So premium pricing is basically having something um, unique, valuable, um, sort of one of a kind about mm -hmm. your product, which lends itself well to the business of embroidery and heat printing where it's small to mid-sized quantities and really just reaching your target market um, in a way that you have something different that you can charge more for. Yeah, and that can even be tied into what we're going to talk about in this eight-part series over, over the next few weeks with improving your brand. It doesn't even necessarily have to be the product, but there can be something about who you are or who your company is that people want 
to do business with you and it allows you to charge a premium price. Yeah, and so for heat printers, you know, we, we pitch this a lot is from a general pricing strategy, operate off of profit per piece mm -hmm. um, as a general rule, um, but combining that with a premium um, price strategy uh, works well because then you can set the profit per piece um, in a way that delivers the most profit back every time you lock down that press. Right, and then one uh, additional strategy that kind of plays off of that premium pricing is called price skimming. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't necessarily have uh, a great ring to it because when you think of skimming it doesn't necessarily... You think of your pull. Right, you don't, you don't bring the right things to mind, but what price skimming is is when you start a particular product or service at a premium price and then after the rest of the market catches up, you lower your price accordingly, knowing that they're going to catch up. So if you were the first one in your town to offer Glitter Flake on you know, t-shirts or jackets or whatever it is that you're decorating, or if you were the first one to offer oversized shirts, you can get that premium price up front, but understand that as soon as somebody else catches on your competition, you're going to have to lower, lower that price to compete. Yeah, if you have a lead uh, to market, if you have intellectual property, perhaps a patent that protects you, um, for a product, a mm -hmm. decoration process, or an item that you've had manufactured, um, this great idea that you had, it's a great opportunity to make that high margin and then start to adjust that back um, as the market catches up, as you said. I like the, the skimming. Actually, I make like it better than premium because it's almost a per product, per decoration strategy where you can really um, leverage it across your product lineup. Yeah, and for it to work, you have to continually add new products and be first to market and you can be known for being first to market and command that premium price. Yeah, so uh, we have economy pricing, we have pricing for market penetration, bundling, uh, pricing at a premium, and price skimming. Um, these are five uh, price sort of philosophies mm -hmm. um, I would say that you can consider for your business, but the whole goal of this is to get you thinking about pricing as a strategic element of your business. It's not as simple as, uh, what price do I want to offer this item at for this quote? Mm -hmm. um, you should have this incorporated in your sales marketing, in your business planning process, so you have a strategic appro approach to pricing that's going to make you um, cash flow positive or accomplish the end goal uh, for the business. Right, and if you need help with how to cost those items for your business, take a look at some of the other resources available on stallstv.com because understanding cost is extremely important to understanding where you're gonna make profit on your pricing. Good, and as you start to sort of work through your uh, business, your business plan, and we're only four months away from starting another year, which is a great time to start thinking yeah. of uh, business planning for calendar year 2017, we thought this eight installment series of eight ways to improve your brand could prove beneficial to letting you be perceived as a company that can charge these premium types of pricing. And so let's share that first installment with you right now. Welcome to the first installment of Eight Ways to Improve Your Brand. Here at Stalls TV, we are always looking for ways to help our customers be more successful. And one of the questions that we always get is, how do I sell more? Well, branding plays a really key role in how much we sell and how successful our businesses are. So this first installment of Eight Ways to Improve Your Brand is all about your logo design, meaning your company logo design, or perhaps a redesign. There are five key elements that we need to look for in a great company logo. So if you're going to be designing your logo for the first time, or if you're considering a redesign, here are the five things that you need to consider. First, you wanna make sure your logo is describable. Take a look at the graphic that we have on screen here. You see the McDonald's logo and a logo for the collective. When we say a logo is describable, it means we can describe it to someone and they can have a vision or a visual of the logo without ever seeing it. So with McDonald's, how would we describe that logo? You've probably described it before in your lifetime. It's the golden arches. How would you describe the logo on the right-hand side of your screen, the collective? Probably not in any way that somebody is going to be able to make sense of what that is in their head before they see it. So make sure when you're designing your logo for the first time or redesigning that it is describable. Second, you want to make sure your logo is memorable. When we say memorable, what makes something easy to remember? If it's simple, it's easy to remember. Take a look at the logos on your screen. These logos we would classify as not memorable because they're not minimal. They're not easy to be described. They're not something that catches your eye right away as easy to understand or easy 
to remember. If you take a look at the Checkpoint Software Technologies logo in the upper left hand side of your screen, you see that we have what looks to be a computer with some dots, squares, lines, all types of different interest pieces in that logo. Not necessarily easy to remember. The logo on the top right hand of your screen is the logo that was designed for the London Olympics in 2012. Again, not really easy to remember. Lots of geometric shapes happening in that logo where uh, we could take the Olympic rings in the top right hand corner. That's an easy to remember or a memorable design. And you see some other examples there as well. So we want to make sure our logo is describable. We want to make sure our logo is memorable, meaning it has minimal design elements. We also want to make sure that our logo looks good in black and white. Take a look at the Chevy logo on your screen. Easy to recognize, easy to remember, whether it's in full color on the left hand side or just in single color on the right hand side. By keeping this in mind when you are designing your logo, if you're designing in single color, not only does it make it easier to remember, not only does it make it look good in print, but it also makes it less expensive for you when you go to make t-shirts and for folks to remember your logo or your graphic. Fourthly, we want to make sure that the logo is scalable. If you take a look at the GE, HP, and Walmart logos, a good rule of thumb is to ask yourself, does the logo look good at a one inch size, which is about where the GE, HP, and the far right Walmart logo is. Does your logo look good at any size? Is it scalable? And the last point to remember when designing or redesigning your logo is to make sure it's relevant. And this one is one of my favorite examples because my kids like to use the font Comic Sans for just about everything. So the example that you're looking at now is font choice on a lot of memorable or good logos being changed to Comic Sans. So when we say the logo should be relevant, if you are a lawyer or if you are a garment decorator of adult garments or performance wear, Comic Sans probably wouldn't be your font choice because that comes off as something that should be used for kids clothes or a child learning center or something to that effect. So when we're looking at logos, we want to make sure they're describable. We want to design logos that are memorable. We want things that look good in black and white. We want logos that are scalable and we also want ones that are relevant. So what if you are not the graphic designer and you're not going to design your own logo? Where can you go to get a logo design that is these five things or where can you find artists that keep these five points of logo design in mind. Let's take a look at a couple websites. I'll give you a couple options. First, we're going to go to Fiverr.com and that is F-I-V-E-R-R.com. If you visit Fiverr.com in the top left hand side you can see graphic and design. We're going to scroll down to the logo design tab and just take a look down at some of the logos that have been designed here. What Fiverr.com is is a community of designers and artists who do jobs for five dollars or more. So you can see the prices starting at in the right hand side under each logo. So you can go in, choose an artist, give them the um, logo design job that you have and they will create you a number of different logos to choose from for just five, some, uh, sometimes up to fifteen or twenty dollars. Now these logos um, from a community perspective don't tend to be what we would consider top-notch but if you're operating on a budget as a startup entrepreneur this is a great place to start however if you want um, a little bit more for your money you can go to a company like 99designs.com which we're looking at here right now so it's the number 99designs.com again another community of designers this is a worldwide community you can see 364,000 people have counted on 99designs to create their logos. And not only do they do logos, they also do packaging design, car wrap design, they can do website design, t-shirt design. 99designs works much like a contest. So you create the contest that you want. You can choose different logos or inspiration from pictures uploaded into your contest to give artists an idea of what you're trying to achieve. You set a price on that contest. I think it's as inexpensive as $299 all the way up to about $1,000. And artists will compete, send you logo designs to choose from, and basically you narrow it down to the top five or the top 10 designs. 
and allow your community of existing customers or family and friends, you can uh, uh, launch a poll to let them vote on what logo they want to choose for your business. Ultimately, the decision remains with you. But 99designs is a great way to get started if you're looking for more uh, branding, more than just a logo. Which leads me to the last piece. You can go out and hire your own graphic designer. And I want to show you a piece, uh, a branding piece that a graphic designer did here in our local area, Uniontown, Pennsylvania. This is branding for a restaurant concept and it's a brand style guide for the Foundry Modern American Kitchen. If you see on the front page, it's basically set up like a catalog, uh, a presentation piece where we're gonna look at six or seven different pages of what the brand should be. So we have a primary logo on the second page. We also have some weathered alternate logos on that second page on the right hand side. On our third page, we have what's called the lockup, which is the whole logo with tagline and the established um, there in 2016. We also have alternate logos. Again, this is a professional graphic designer uh, that was contracted out of the local area in Pittsburgh. I'm sure if you're near a city or if you have a university nearby, a local college, you have some professional designers there that you can call on to do these types of things. So this particular designer went a step further and chose more than just a logo. He also chose, if you look on page four, typography or fonts that should be used when building a website or when building marketing materials and you can see their usage on the right hand side of that page. If we look at the next page, this designer also built a color palette. So we see this particular company's uh, color palette is black, a version of uh, like a bluish gray, a red, a white, and a charcoal. There's also logo usage guidelines on the right hand side things not to do to your logo. This is gonna be very helpful for you as you build your business and you have to contract out more work for marketing materials or t-shirt printing or advertising that you need to do on billboards or with other local businesses. You don't want another designer taking your logo that you spent money on and ruining it. So you have logo usage guidelines as this is a way to not use our logo as well as a way to use it. And you can also look at the texture and imagery that is approved for this particular company's logo. It's the look and feel that they want to communicate for their company. So you have weathered wood, you have craft paper, you have slate, you have newsprint that's available to use as backgrounds for this logo for online advertising. We'll show you just real quick. The graphic designer who did this particular piece, his name is Daniel Gerwin, and he believes that a cohesive brand is a beautiful brand. And we're gonna be taking you there over this eight step series on different ways to elevate or improve your brand. This was installment one, how to design or redesign your logo. Thanks for joining me. So thanks for sharing that first installment of eight ways to improve your brand with a logo design or redesign. I think there were some helpful tips and resources that um, our viewers can tap into. The next installment is going to talk about the importance of mission uh, when it comes to a brand. And so we'll look forward to that next week. Additionally, next week, mm -hmm. um, we're launching yet another new part of the Stalls TV Morning Show based on your feedback, and it's going to be called Look of the Week. So every week, we are going to have a new look, and we hope you'll submit uh, stuff to this look. Uh, all you need to do is email tv at stalls.com. There'll be more info on that uh, showing up in the blog and on future morning shows. But the concept of this is we want to show you a new uh, decoration technique, maybe just a look that stood out to us, and then also share with you the blank garment where you can source that as just a little antidote of inspiration. Here, I thought we were talking about Courtney Kay's outfits each week. Uh, well, we <laughs> that could be another look of the week sort of sidebar. Yeah. Has she duplicated yet, by the way? Um, awfully darn close if she hasn't. Yeah, okay. But anyway, so look of the week, we're looking forward to that. And then next week, uh, Courtney <coughs> Kay will be back. She'll be joined by Jenna, and they'll be hosting the morning show, uh, bringing you not only the look of the week, but talking about accessories and opportunity uh, opportunities really to decorate accessory items with, um, I know one thing that's going to be um, shown in that is um, hair bows um, as one particular part of it. I'll probably talk about bundling as well. So for anybody who was really interested in the bundling topic on pricing strategies, I know that's kind of Courtney's specialty. Yep, absolutely. So as always, thanks for watching the Stalls TV Morning Show. We'll see you again next week.